My guest tonight is Dr. Chinedu Oranye, the doctor of rediscovering God. And he contends that the church today faces the tyrancy of the physical. And he calls us to a place of the pursuit of the inner man, a pursuit of God. This is James Talk Africa. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Welcome there viewers to this edition of your show, Chim's Talk Africa. We have quite a lineup for you today. My guest, Dr. Oranya, is quite inspirational in the way he analyzes our need to return to a deep place with the Lord, a place of uh, seeking the growth of the inner man. And uh, you don't want to miss that interview. But before we go into it, I want to share with you about the challenge of the Yao people in Malawi. It's a country that has known a lot of missionary work. David Livingstone was one of the very first missionaries to take the gospel to Malawi around 1894. And a lot of churches exist in Malawi, but there's an ethnic group in Malawi called the Yao people or the Chiyao. And this group of people are more than 90% Muslims. They are found around the lake Malawi part of Malawi. That is in the southeastern part of Malawi. And it's a large population of people. In Malawi, there are about 3 million of them. And you have a large population of them also in Mozambique. This is a predominantly Muslim group. And it's a challenge for us as Christians in Africa. Uh, for many years, since around the late 18th century up to recent times, it's been very difficult to evangelize these people. But in the last 20 years, God has been doing such great things among the, uh, the Yahoos. You see, it's as if there's a move of the Spirit on the basis of the prayer of those who have been praying for the Yao people in Malawi that has made many of the formerly closed villages and towns very open. Uh, we have missionaries working in Mangochi, which is the major town or city of the Yao people. And right now, there is a big cry for more laborers. Around the Yao people, there is a need for people who will go into different villages and different towns of this Yao people to take the gospel. That's why I'm bringing the challenge to you. Uh, if Jesus looks at the 90-something percent uh, tage of these people who don't have the gospel, many times haven't even heard it for once. He's saying, who shall I send who will go for us? And I want to challenge you, perhaps as you listen to me, God is speaking to you about his call upon you to go as a missionary. It doesn't matter which part of Africa you are where you listen to me. I'd like you to contact us on the number on the screen, the website on the screen, or just send us some WhatsApp. I was so glad when some weeks back we got such response from the last call for people who will go as missionaries to the island of Mayotte. And uh, we got people signing up to say, I feel God calling me to go full time. Some of you are watching me, but God's spoken to you before. And I want you to respond. Contact us today. God is looking for workers to send as evangelists among these people in Malawi. Yeah, contact us and uh, we'll help you from there. The mission agency listed on the screen will help process your uh, call and get you into the field to preach the gospel. Uh, we'll go now to my interview with Dr. Orion. You would want to just sit close to your set because he challenges us away from the what he calls the tyranny of the physical, the material things, into the secret place of seeking God and just basking in knowing him more. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <music> Welcome, dear viewers. Like I said in the beginning, we have with us today Dr. Conrad Oranya, who is a Christian leader and an author of the book Rediscovering God. You're welcome to the show, Dr. Oranya. Thank you, Chim. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oranya, we want to talk about this issue of, that seems to be your passion right now. The fact that you feel that we need to rediscover the 
religion of the inner man or inner life. What does that mean? You know, Chim, thank you for this. I, I carry a heavy burden, and I believe this is the burden in the heart of the Lord himself. It's a burden that the early Christian fathers had. It's the burden that what some people called Christian mystics had, a burden to help people discover the treasures of who Jesus is and who Jesus is in man and how to live that out to the fullest. And so we have today a growing Christian reality that focuses so much more on the external. There is so much emphasis on the material to the detriment of the development of the inner life. Christianity, first of all, is Christ in us, revealing the glory of God on the outside. As we learn to dig deep into who Christ is in us, the glory of God begins to show on the outside. Now, why do you think this is uh, an issue with us today? Because People would say the church is growing, I mean, especially in Africa. Churches are springing up everywhere. Why is it, is that not revival? There are two ways to look at anything. You can look at something quantitatively, and you, look, you can look at it qualitatively. Now, people who measure quantity sometimes forget that you can have large crowds who are totally empty on the inside. And so when we talk of revival, usually in Africa we are looking at large churches, yeah. large attendance. But when you dig deep, you find we aren't growing in terms of drinking fresh water from the wells of God. Let me read something to you. Romans 10 verse 2, Paul says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now, talking about the Jews, they had a zeal for God. It's possible to have great zeal and great numbers of people who are zealous, but not according to the expectations of God. God's primary desire is that we grow in intimacy, that we drink fresh waters from the well of God. Would you say that, I mean, I hear you on this because I, I know myself how many times I fall into the danger of measuring myself by the number of activities I do, and those, that's quantity again, the, 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 my zeal. And you're saying there's an error there, there's a trap there, especially for those of us who are leaders. There's a trap in which you find yourself and you feel it's okay if I measure myself by the exteriors. But what you should be measuring yourself is with your inner man. Would you say our challenge comes with the pervasive, what you would call pseudo, or what do you call it, prosperity teaching of today? Would you say that's part of our challenge? You know, the challenge is actually what I call the oppression of the physical. The oppression of the physical means that the physical material world oppresses us. The physical material world becomes the only world we see as real. Now, the churches and the pastors and the ministers tend to flow with that oppression because everyone is thinking the physical things are the real things. But friends, the physical things are passing away. The reality is actually the things that we do not see. And so there is an oppression. Let me read what St. Augustine said. St. Augustine said, Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. I, I do recall that your website is the Restless Pilgrim. Uh, uh, viewers, you can go to the restlesspregrim.org. Am I correct, Dr. Yes. Oranya? Restlesspregrim.org. And uh, you can go there. There are a lot of resources there. 
In fact, you go by the nickname the restless pilgrim. Uh, tell me, what does the restless pilgrim mean? The fallacy, the heresy, the incredible hypocrisy of modern Christianity is to teach men that they can find rest in material things. Mm. So the more goods you have, you'll find rest. So you run after more cars, more houses, more money. And there's nothing wrong in a good house and in good cars and in good houses, nothing wrong whatsoever. But when that becomes the pivot of your life, you are actually turning your back away from the true source of rest. One book I would highly recommend is The Pursuit of God. He says, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. Many ordinary treasures may be denied him, or if he's allowed to have them, the enjoyment of them will be so tempered that they will never be necessary for his happiness. Or if he must see them go one after the other, he would scarcely feel a sense of loss. For having the source, that's God, of all things, he has in one all satisfaction, all pleasure, all delight. Whatever this man may lose, he has actually lost nothing, for he has now all in one, and he has it purely, legitimately, and forever. Wow. That's a man who is rich there. That's a rich man. You know what, well, what we're going to do, viewers? We're going to take a break here. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Conrad Oraya, the author of Rediscovering God, a devotional from the book of the whole book of Genesis. And it's free for download at restlesspilgrim.org. We'll take a short break and we'll be back. Thanks a lot, audience. <laughs> Do you have any opinions or comments on today's subject or any other issues in your country or around Africa? We would love for you to join the conversation. Please send us your comments by WhatsApp video, voice or text message to the number on your screen or via Facebook, Twitter or email. We may be able to include your text, audio or video comments on a future show. Welcome back, dear viewers, to the second segment of our conversation with Dr. Conrad Oraye. He's the author of the book, Rediscovering God, a devotional on the book of Genesis. And we've been talking about the journey of the inner man or rediscovering this, this emphasis on the inner man. You know, just before we went on the break, you, you were quoting from Toza and you were talking about the essence of this whole thing. And my mind is going with the question that most of our viewers will be thinking too. How do you do this in this modern age? How do you, do you go up in the, to a mountain and just stay there away from everybody? Because the reality is there's food to cook, there are children who are crying, there's, there are bills to be paid, the car has to be serviced, and on and on, the exterior demands are on us. So how do you do this journey practically? It starts with the thought life. It's not with the action, but with the thought life. Now, the world is oppressive. The world is suppressive. The world is saying, look at us, look at me. The world is saying, you cannot do without me. And we need to take one step back and say, we can actually survive without you. Chim, do you know that your phone is a beautiful instrument, but your phone is a taskmaster? Your phone demands attention. You can say that again. Your phone <laughs> is saying to you, turn away from everything and look at me. And that is where the battle really is. The battle is in the mind. When you have victory in your mind, you first of all conquer yourself. You start by saying to yourself, I can survive without some things. I can actually survive 
without watching television. I can survive without my phone. I can survive without people. The real battle is in the mind. Can I say to myself, God is so worthy of attention that I choose to give him attention against all the other taskmasters. So practically, number one, we need to dedicate time away from things and time for God. For example, first thing in the morning, rather than start with picking up your phone, rather than start with writing a list of things you want to do, rather than thinking of all the tasks for today, there's what we call the discipline of solitude. It could be 30 minutes, but it's 30 minutes of quietness, 30 minutes of silence, 30 minutes of focus. It doesn't have to be 10 hours. Now, the monks could do days and days on end. And actually, viewers, I will encourage you to practice extended times. It could be 30 minutes, it could be one hour, but block out times in your day, block out times in your week, block out times in your month, block out times in your year. When you actually fast from people, you fast from gadgets, you fast from things. It's easier to fast food than to fast activities. And then secondly, is nurture your inner man through reading. Now, one of the things that kills our world today is that we are reading, I'm sorry to say this is on air, but we are reading junk. Yeah, we are reading you, junk. You go, you go through some of our Christian bookshops today. We and, are reading uh, things that have no they, they relevance. Some of the things are not actually ministering to the inner man. It it's actually ends up being a distraction. And one of the ways to do that is stepping away. Go back and read books of the early fathers, St. Augustine, the A.W. Tozers, the Fabers, the, 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 the Finneys, the Wesleys, the Spurgeons. Now, these are men nobody wants to read today, but they help us dig deep. They call us away. So the first thing is, yes, we must block out chunks of time. The second thing is we need to change what we feed on. Change our diet. We need to change our spiritual, spiritual diet. diet. If all you're reading is 10 steps to become a millionaire, mm. five steps to succeed overnight, mm. three steps to find your life partner today. Or to find your real self. You know, all these things are, and Chim, to be very honest, I say this without apologies, there is a thin line between the modern teachings of Christianity and New Age. Mm. Because New Age is all about self-actualization. But Jesus never taught self-actualization. He taught God-actualization. You find your fullness in God. Mm. You find your rest in God. So practically, mm. the churches are saying, come to the church and we would make you full and free and joyful and happy. But Jesus says, don't come to the church to find this. Come to me and I will give you rest. That is, that is so true. Uh, especially what you say about us going back to the early voices. You know, the, the one time I was reading where it says that the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died. Mm. And so the one that came began to oppress the Israelites. And I thought how much the lack of history lessons, spiritual history le lessons affect us. People the, don't even know, know those what people our anymore. No. So because he didn't know what God did then and what God said then, he was misbehaving. If only he knew. And I said to myself, how much we need to hear what God said to our fathers before. Like the various people you've been quoting. These are voices that still speak today, if we would listen. So the third thing we need to grow into this life of digging and dredging the inner wells of the spirit is to have someone we call a spiritual nurturer or a spiritual helper. Simply, it means someone who walks the road with you. 
We need to find people in our generation who are children of the burning heart, people who are hungry and restless. And like you said, I call myself the restless pilgrim. And I'm asking those who are restless, who are hungry for more, to join me in this pilgrimage, this seeking for more than the temporal and the immediate. When your mentor meets with you, it's not just for you to share your heart. He pulls you deeper. He pulls you away. He's asking you deep questions. What are you hearing from God? What is God speaking to your spirit? How much solitude are you having every day? How much time are you having with God every week? When last did you go on a retreat? Now, these are the practical things that need to happen. So essentially, you're talking about three different things. You're talking about the fact to actually contend for time with God. Number two, to open up ourselves to the voices of the fathers of before, to get back to our history lessons. And thirdly, to find others, especially those who are a bit further than us, who can help along the way. Dear viewers, this is where we'd have to wrap up this segment of this show. We've been talking to Dr. Chinedu Oraye. He's the author of Rediscovering God, a devotional on the book of Genesis. And it's free for you to download from restlesspilgrim.org. And uh, we'll stop here at this, uh, at this segment, dear viewers, and uh, we'll be back later. I'll be back later to wrap this up. Thank you so much, live audience, for being here. Welcome back, dear viewers. Uh, I told you that conversation was going to be quite inspiring. I think my, my biggest takeaway from that challenge that Dr. Ranya brought us is that beyond the excuses we give for our busy life, we need to find time. We need to contend for time with God. Uh, it doesn't matter how busy you are. Uh, there is a way by which you can steal away time to spend time with God. It's a priority. Uh, we need to feed our inner man just the way we feed our outer man. In fact, more than we feed our Adam outer man, with time spent with God, with meditations on his word, I want to challenge you to make this, uh, 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 return back to the discipline of spending time with God and his word. Uh, anyway, that was quite challenging. Before we go, I want to go to the final part of our teaching. Remember, we have been dealing with the topic offerings in righteousness, and we're reading from the book of Malachi. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as the days gone by, as in former years. We said that God wants to have men and women who will be for him and bring for him offerings in righteousness. Remember that, like we said since the last few weeks, we're giving away a free ebook. It's called Offerings in Righteousness. This is a book I've written that goes into detail about this teaching, really will help you to find out who you are in Christ and how you can walk in the free gift of righteousness that he has given you. Contact the numbers on the screen and we'll be happy, more than happy, to send you this resource for free. But let's go to the last part of our teaching, and this is it. The fact that righteousness is by faith sometimes leads to people having a misconception, and that is the misconception that faith leads to being passive. Many people have this idea of faith that if I'm walking by faith, then I do nothing. No, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says the very opposite. In the book of Hebrews 11, which is normally called the Hall of Fame of Heroes of Faith, you find this, the verbs keep coming up. It says, by faith Abel offered a sacrifice. Notice the word offered. By faith Noah moved with godly fear. Notice the word moved. By faith Abraham obeyed. By faith, Moses refused to be called. Now, all of these are verbs. It says, by faith, they, the children of Israel, passed through the Red Sea. They walked through the Red Sea. Faith in the Bible always leads to action. You can have action and not have faith, but you cannot have faith without having action. Anytime there is true biblical faith, it leads to, it produces action. That is why when we come to this subject of 
receiving the righteousness that God has given us by faith. What James says in James chapter 2 verse 26 is so crucial. Faith without works is dead. Faith that doesn't produce definite action on the part of the man who says he has faith is not faith at all. You see, this is the what you call the response of faith. James says this. He says, show me your faith without deeds. He knew this was impossible. And I will show you my faith by what I do. That is, he's saying, I'll show you my faith by the actions born of what I believe. My response to the grace of God working in me. When the grace of God works in us, it always leads to something being produced outside of us. When there is faith in the inside, it produces action on the outside. And this is, this is the same thing you get, whether it's physical healing, whatever you have to do with God. Faith always produces action. Take, for example, a person believes that God has healed him. He begins to act as if what he believes is true and then he sees the healing. Many times people will tell you this is how God's operation of miraculous healing has happened in their life. Of course there's, there are exceptions but when it comes to receiving the righteousness that God has given us and when it comes to receiving it by faith there are two steps. The first step is to believe that what God has done in your life is true and then the second step which is a response to faith is to act as if it is true. You see, uh, when, we, when we believe, the next response is to act as if it is true. It has nothing to do with the way we feel. You see, it has nothing to do with the issue of temptation. Now, I want to explain a bit about temptation. Temptation are suggestions to do evil. That doesn't mean you're unrighteous. The fact that you get a thought in your mind saying, do this ill or do that evil, it's temptation. Many times the devil has flawed some believers by thinking, just because I had an evil thought, then I've sinned. No. Temptation is different from the actual act of sin. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was tempted. He actually received suggestions from the devil into his mind to do ill, but he didn't do it. We walk in righteousness as we overcome temptations by choosing to obey God. Now, the way we choose to obey God is because we believe by faith that he has given us his righteousness. And we act as if that is true. This is what I call the practice of faith. It is our response to what God is doing in us. And I want to challenge you to begin to see yourself as somebody who has received the righteousness of God and begin to believe it and act as if it is true. And think of that doors you see at the malls or you see at some, some, some important building. You're walking towards it, it is the automatic doors that open only as you approach them. You see, when you're approaching them, it seems as if they will never open. Who will be there to open it for you? But when you get close enough, it opens. Same thing with faith. You might think, how will I stop this addiction? How will I do this? Where is the power? I don't feel anything. It doesn't depend on what you feel. You start to go towards that door, even though you know it's closed. But when you get close enough, it will open. In the same way, begin to act as if God's righteousness is in you. And you'll find that, that actually his power to overcome sin is already in you. It's not you trying to manufacture something. It's you acknowledging what God has done in you. This is what James said about Abraham. He said, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Can you see this is faith coming full circle. Abraham, faith and his works completed the work of God in him. And I challenge you in the same way. Be conscious of what Christ has done for you and begin to act as if it's true. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Remember to ask for your free ebook, and we'll be more than happy to send it to you. See you again next week. Bye-bye. Next week on Chimstock Africa, my guest, Larry Bale, is the CEO of the Business School of Netherlands. And he will be talking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in the marketplace. If you don't give up, there's always a solution. And most of the time that you feel that your boss is a problem, your boss will actually be a solution. Because God used the stumbling blocks that you think are stumbling blocks as stepping stone to greatness for you. Join me next week on Chimstock Africa. This program is made possible by the generous financial support of believers just like you who share our heart to equip the African church to engage the issues facing our continent. Your financial support will help us continue this important work. If you feel led to give to this ministry, please visit our website today.